Okay, this will be a continuation of the verse-by-verse study through Romans 9, 10, and 11. And as I mentioned in a previous video, this almost is like a, a third church that I'm able to pastor. Now, I know as apostasy is, there's so few Bible believers that some of you um, don't even have a Bible-believing church within driving distance, meaning two or three hours. Possibly you could set up something in your home and invite friends over to sit down and watch something, develop your own little church in your house, uh, like Paul mentioned, having a church in a house. And then you could just have two or three gathered together, and there uh, Christ is in the midst of you. Um, but I know in this time of apostasy, it is hard to find a Bible-believing church and sometimes a person has to obviously uh, display some maturity, and you're not going to agree with uh, anybody 100% of the time. In fact, a lot of times, I don't even agree with myself. But here we are in Romans 10, and Paul mentioned in chapter 8 about the saints of Rome being the children of God. So that brings up the question is, what about Israel? Uh, they've been called the people of God all through the Old Testament, the children of Israel were. And so Paul brings up that topic in 9, 10, and 11. We're in chapter 10, and in the middle chapter, or the heart of this subject, Paul is introducing a better testament to the Jews. Uh, now, this better testament to the Jews is also offered to whosoever. Anyone, anyone. And in Hebrews 8, verse 6 says, But now hath he attained, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much more also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay, now in this context, he's dealing with the, a better covenant or the new covenant that will be made between God and Israel during the late portion of the tribulation going into the millennium, actually going into the millennium. But in Romans 9, it's a hint of a new covenant uh, with Israel or a new covenant a better testament, I'm sorry, I should say, a better testament or a better way of distributing or dispensing righteousness. In Romans 10, verse 1, Paul said, Brethren, in this context, he is dealing with his uh, fleshly kindred. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So Paul has a great burden for the Jews. His calling was to the Gentiles. Paul said, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay, when Paul testified to them in Acts 22, he mentioned that idea where he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, in a city of Cilicia, uh, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, depends how you want to pronounce it, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death. Now, the uh, law authority, the authority that Paul was relying upon, this persecution of born-again believers is found in Deuteronomy chapter 13, where they could, under the Old Testament covenant, execute false prophets. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. And that's the only religion the Bible establishes or recognizes. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous 
of the traditions of my fathers. So Paul is telling him, hey, I've got, you got zeal, I've got zeal, we both have zeal, but our zeal is misplaced. In Philippians 3, Paul said in verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, yet if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So under the Old Testament covenant, Paul was touching the righteousness that was available to the Jew under the law. Now he is going to introduce a better testament in chapter 10, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Okay, this ignorance of the Jews, it's not saying they're stupid or anything. It's just saying they've ignored this idea. This is the great prayer of forgiveness that Jesus prayed on the cross is giving uh, Israel, gave Israel a second chance in the book of Acts where he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Okay, they did not know. They, the people did not know they were crucifying the righteousness of God. In Acts 3, verse 17 uh, Paul, well, in verse uh, 16, and his name through faith in his name, in the context, the name will be Jesus Christ, okay, in his name, uh, and it says, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith, the faith, that's the first time that's found in the New Testament, the faith, those two words together, it'll be the faith of Jesus Christ, Acts 3.16, Uh, 316s are quite an interesting study. Uh, But yet the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it as did also your rulers. You ignorantly crucified Uh, the righteousness of God in Romans 10, 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law. So again, this topic is about Israel. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay, now that wasn't offered in the former testament, in the Old Testament. Okay, no matter what anybody says, there is clear there are clearly differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Paul is revealing this. He is going to contrast in Romans 10, verse 5, with the righteousness of the law versus the righteousness of faith. And he's revealing to Israel, this is a better deal. So on the screen, side by side, will be righteousness passages about the righteousness of the law versus the better testament, the righteousness which is of faith. When you put them side by side like this, it's a good way of like, like, it's like you're putting the level on the side of, uh, you know, a wall making sure that you have it straight and level. So in Romans 10, 5, Paul wrote, For Moses, okay, because the topic's about Israel, describeth the righteousness which is of the law. So, does that mean there's righteousness which is of the law? Uh, Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly what he's saying. Okay, in Galatians chapter 3, he clearly makes the statement 
He says in verse 12, Galatians 3, 12, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Okay, but there was a form of righteousness that one can attain under the law, and Moses was describing it. So he says that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. Okay, now if you go to the passage that he is using Moses' description is in Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. This one says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. Okay, so that would be going down to verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Okay, so that parallels verse 12. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it down to us that we may hear it and do it. And that's why I've highlighted the word do it or doeth and do it. The words do it. Then verse 7 of Romans 10. Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Okay, the Deuteronomy passage Neither is it beyond the sea. Okay, I can see the is is kind of messed up there. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Now in the Romans uh, 10, verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. And in verse 14, But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. So you can see the contrast. Hopefully you can see the contrast. And if you want to kind of, sort of, kind of believe that uh, people are saved or they get the righteous of God the same way in the Old Testament and New Testament, that's your right uh, to believe that. But uh, I dare say you don't have the authority of the scriptures. You have your personal opinion. You can come up with a nice little cliche that people in the Old Testament lean forward to the cross by faith. And in the New Testament, they lean backward to the cross by faith. But it's a nice cliche, but uh, there is really no authority from that from the Bible. I mean, obviously, you got to see the differences. Now, right here we go. Uh, people who are dispensational in their... Um, understanding of the Bible, for some reason, many times, they will not extend that out to the dispensing of righteousness. And the ones who are adamantly trying to say they're the same in the old and the new, uh, these bullies may create a drama about the disagreements in the beliefs of others. And this drama may draw a crowd, but that crowd will generally be a self-righteous followers of this bully. And this seems to be one of the hotbeds for dispensations. Well, well, I'm a dispensationalist, but everybody saved the same way throughout the Bible. Uh, well, you can believe that if you want, uh, but uh, I'm not jumping on that bandwagon. And if, if, if at that point that bully is going to say, oh, you're a heretic, you're a heretic, you're lost and going to hell. And they're going to make all sorts of stuff. But these self-righteous bullies are not allowing the Bible to say what it said to whom it's spoken to. Now, these passages in Romans uh, will often, are often used for the ending of the Romans road, which is okay to have that plan when you witness to people. 
But this offer, he is talking to Israel here. It is ultimately to all people. Okay, and the, these adamant bullies of this self-righteousness, uh, they're going to claim, you know, a bunch of people are falsely converted if they don't follow their specific plan. So uh, I just kind of smile and, you know, let the, ch you know, children are meant to be seen, uh, not heard. So it's quite clear in my mind, I am fully persuaded that Deuteronomy uh, verse 12, 13, and 14 says, do it three times. And when Paul cited that in Romans 10, 6, 7, and 8, he did not mention do it. He changed it to faith. Okay, that's why he said the righteousness which is of the law, and then the statement he makes in 5, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. This explains why when those Jews came to John the Baptist in chapter ten, uh, 3, you have three groups of people. You have the general populace, the people. It says, and the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? And he answered their question. And then the political figureheads said in verse 12, Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And then he answered them. And then in verse 14, the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? The reason why they're asking these questions is because of their knowledge of the law. It, these are perfectly legitimate questions. When uh, Peter, who is an apostle to the circumcision in Acts 2, is telling Jewish people and Jewish proselytes that they murdered their Messiah, they rejected their Messiah, the very logical conclusion and question that they ask in verse 37 of chapter 2 in Acts, he says, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's why they asked that question, because the law was based upon do it. You know, and a lot of folks run to Hebrews chapter 11, you know, what's commonly called the Hall of Faith chapter, but they overlook the entire statements in that chapter where a man says, by faith, and then it mentions something that he does, his works, because he is talking to Hebrews. This is why in James chapter 1, he's in verse 22, he said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Why does he say that? It's because he has addressed this letter. James is another apostle to the circumcision, according to Galatians 2, 9, and he addressed his letter uh, to the 12 tribes that were scattered. In James 1, 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then in uh, chapter 4 of verse 11, he says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So all I'm trying to show you is, can you see differences here between the Old Testament and what Moses, or uh, what Jesus, Paul said between Moses and Paul. It's interesting. Moses received the religious uh, doctrines for Judaism on Mount Sinai. 
And Paul received the doctrines for the faith of Jesus Christ or into the generation of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, on Mount Sinai also. And on Mount Sinai, here's what God revealed to Moses about righteousness, which is of the law. And the Lord commanded us, Deuteronomy 6, 24, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. That is Old Testament doctrine. Have you ever wondered uh, why in Matthew 19, when a young man came up to Jesus and said, Good master, what shall I do to have eternal life? And then in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Barnabas or Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved. Now, those questions are not identical, but boy, are they close. Eternal life, saved. And then if you look at the answers, why did they have, are there two different answers? Okay, Jesus, why did not Jesus say, believe on me and you shall have eternal life? Why did Paul say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved? Why are there differences? Well, one is, in Matthew 19, occurs before Calvary. Two is, Jesus lived under the Jewish law, so he is answering according to religious Judaism. He is answering properly. Acts 16 occurs after Calvary, and Paul is answering according to a better testament where righteousness is dispensed by faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul here in Romans 10 is revealing a better testament, first to Israel, and then secondarily to anyone who will listen to what he's written And it is a better deal to be saved by grace through faith and receive God's righteousness on your account in heaven by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ.